Alrighty, so we are going to get started. We are going to continue our lectures for this unit. Um, we have been spending most of our time on imperialism, right? But this this other portion of the unit um, is World War One. Okay, and so we will um, today be doing a review of World War One. Okay, this is all information you should have already learned in um, world history. Okay, so nothing I'm covering today should be new to you. If it's new to you, that means you either forgot it or maybe your teacher didn't talk about it. I doubt it. Um, I, I, I kept this pretty basic. Um, uh, certainly those of you who had me last year, we covered all of this because this is just my notes from that lecture uh, kind of tailored to this environment. So um, today, here's what I would say. You may not need to take a ton of notes. And that's okay. You may not have pages and pages of notes for this one because this should be a review, okay? Here's what I would encourage you. I would encourage you to write down things that you did not remember, okay? And for some of you, that's gonna be a lot. For some of you, it's not gonna be a ton, right? Write down the key points that you did not remember, right? If you remember the, the, the information, don't write it down again. You already have these slides that you can review again and remind yourself, but you already know it, okay? All right, so we are today going to look at an overview or a review of World War I, pretty much as you learned it last year, right? We need to understand this war. We need to understand where it came from, why it's happening. Um, and then on our next class, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, World War I from the perspective of the United States on the home front, right? What did, how did it impact life here? All right, so... With that, let's dive in. You'll also notice there are certain slides that just say straight up, like, don't write them down. Um, don't write any of that down, right? It's it's mostly to move the story along. It's it's not intended um, to, to be, you know, potential test material or anything like that. All right, so here we go. Let's look at the causes of World War I. Um, you should have been given a handy dandy, like, uh, mnemonic device to remember these last year, right? It's the main causes of World War I, main, because that spells Maine. Here we go. Um, but the United States, the, the, the reason the United States is going to end up involved in this war is that we are now an industrial and an imperialist power, right? We, are, we now have a global presence. And so when these events occur, the United States is going to have very little choice but to respond, right? We are no longer this isolated uh, self-contained unit. We are now out and about in the world, right? We are large and in charge. We talked about last week, um, the open door policy. Remember, we were left out of the conversation in China quickly being uh, kicked out of or left out of China entirely, um, only to come up with a plan and go from like, you know, not even involved to now we're leading the charge, right? Um, the United States somehow convinces the world that we are the dominant power and that we're in charge of a lot of things. And so a lot of people are looking at the United States when World War I hits, a lot of it because of our economy and a lot of it because no one's fighting on the, in the United States, right? They're, all this fighting is in Europe. European factories are being destroyed, all of that, right? So um, again, let's remind ourselves of those main causes of World War I. The M in Maine is for militarism. Right, militarism is the strong buildup of armed forces to intimidate or threaten other nations. Right, it's it's again, it's building more uh, warships, it's building more uh, munitions factories, it's building up your arsenal of of weapons, it's building up your army. Right, it's this this strong buildup of armed forces. So it's not just the weapons, but it's also building your military. Right, drafting more people into the army, recruiting more people into your uh, your navies and whatnot. Right, so militarism, right. And the big thing here that uh, hopefully you remember is that it, the events that we're going to talk about set off an arms race, particularly between Germany and Britain. Germany and Britain are racing each other to have the strongest navies, right? Uh, again, Alfred Mann, this, this theory that the Navy is the future of warfare. A lot of these major countries buy into this theory. Germany and Britain certainly buy into it. Um, and so this militarism is particularly visible. Like our prime example of this is this arms race between Germany and Britain to have the strongest Navy. The A in, in Maine 
right? The main causes is alliances. This should sound super familiar to you. Hopefully you remember these alliances, right? An alliance is a formal relationship between nations, particularly in this case with a pre-arranged commitment to come to each other's aid in war. If you get attacked, we are in an alliance. If you get attacked, I promise I'm going to come fight for you, right? If you declare war on somebody and we're in an alliance, I promise that I'm going to join you in that declaration of war, right? It's, it's this idea, right, that just because we're friends, you promise to fight whenever I fight, right? Um, if you've ever been on campus and wit witnessed a fight, um, again, it's, you know, when the one person gets hit and like their, their, their homies jump in, right? Um, it happens, right? We see it, but this is on a global scale, right? A country gets attacked and the other countries join in. The uh, first of these alliances that we want to remember is the Triple Entente, okay? The Triple Entente, or we can call them the allies if you'd like, because eventually they will be allies of the United States. Um, and we are from the United States, so they would be our allies. Uh, you have the Triple Entente, which is Britain, France, and Russia. Okay, Britain, France, and Russia. And then you have the Triple Alliance, the Triple Alliance or the Central Powers. Again, if you can picture the World War, uh, picture the map of Europe, right? These Central Powers are all in the middle. They're all together. Uh, Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Italy is starred there. Uh, make yourself a note, Italy never fights on the side of the Triple Alliance. Okay, I'm going to show you a chart later that has uh, kind of every side laid out in all the major European countries beyond these. Um, and you will see Italy will be listed with the Triple Entente or the, the Allies. Um, Italy never fights for uh, the Central Powers. They are part of that alliance, though. They are initially part of that alliance, which is why we list them there, right? It's the Triple Entente versus the Triple Alliance, the Allies versus the Central Powers, however you want to remember that. Okay. The I in main causes of imperialism of, of World War I, excuse me, is imperialism, right? And we've been talking a lot about this, right? Countries competing for colonies uh, because colonies provide markets and raw materials, right? We've, we've been talking about that. I'm not gonna belabor that point. That's what we've been going over for the last two weeks, okay? And then the last cause, the N in main is nationalism, right? A feeling of intense pride in one's homeland, emphasis on promoting one's homelands, culture, and interests. Um, I ask this question in my world history class, um, and it's an important distinction, right? We need to understand the distinction between nationalism and being patriotic, or nationalism and patriotism, okay? Um, and here is what I would tell you is the difference, right? I, if we had time, I would love to uh, open this up and make it a discussion and see if you, what, what factors you think distinguish them. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to just tell you nationalism, right? Nationalism goes beyond just loving one's country, right? Being patriotic, you love your country, right? Uh, being patriotic, you, uh, you love your country, you love, you know, the, in our case, uh, people associate patriotism with the flag and with supporting our military and loving apple pie and baseball and country music and, you know, rock and roll, whatever, right? Like we have a lot of things that we, we think are patriotic, right? Um, and patri patriotism is just loving one's country, okay? Nationalism takes it to a whole nother level. Nationalism is like loving your country on steroids, right? Nationalism takes it to a new level. Patriotism just says, I love my country, right? It says nothing about other countries. Nationalism says, I love my country because my country is superior, right? It places a relationship between your country and other countries. It says, my country is the best, yours is inferior, right? Nationalism is not just this uh, love of country and this pride. It's like, my country is absolutely the best, right? It's, it's patriotism on steroids. Patriotism doesn't tend to uh, influence war, Okay, patriotism says I love my country. It has no statement about another country. When somebody says, well, it's patriotic to go to war, it's patriotic to defend your country. What they're talking about is nationalism, right? What they're talking about is, is actually nationalism. Patriotism just says that you like something or that you, you, know, you love it, whatever, right? Um, that you're, you, you enjoy it. 
nationalism is what you rise to defend it, right? It's not patriotic to defend it, it's nationalistic to defend it, right? That's not to say nationalism is always bad, right? Or patriotism is always good and not bad. Like both have, there's, you know, there's always ways things can swing that they become dangerous, right? In this case, nationalism drives this conflict, right? It drives this conflict, particularly between Germany and Britain, right? It's this, this intense feeling that they need to crush the other country to prove that their country is better, right? That is the, the risk of nationalism, right? It's this risk uh, uh, that you're going to basically disrespect other nations or that you're going to enter into a fight simply to prove you're better, right? Um, okay. So those are the causes of World War I, right? The underlying causes, militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, right? But, uh, you know, those are all theories. Those are all kind of uh, philo philosophical type things. What actually begins the war, uh, hopefully you remember, um, this gentleman, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, right? He is heir to the Aus Austrian throne. He's killed by a Serbian um, nationalist, group, the Serbian Black Hand, right? Uh, he's killed by a member of that group, Gavrilo Princip, in 1914, okay? Austria-Hungary goes ahead and then declares war on Serbia, and this is where those alliances start coming in, right? Uh, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, and so Serbia's allies jump in, uh, which then causes Austria-Hungary's allies to jump in, right? And it becomes a, a, a domino effect of these other major powers joining in this fight for no other reason than they're in an alliance, right? They have no dog in the fight. They just happen to have these friends and these allies, and so they jump in the fight, okay? Um, World War I, we often associate with trench warfare. Uh, if any of you saw the movie uh, that just recently came out in 1917, right? Excellent film. It's a, it's from the um, British soldiers perspective, right? In World War I. Um, excellent, excellent film. If you, if you have not seen it, um, I recommend talking to your parents and guardians about watching it. Um, I don't remember the rating on it, so um, I'm not going to just tell you to go watch it. Talk to your parents and guardians about seeing it. Um, it's a very, very good film, very well done. Um, but trench warfare becomes uh, the, the main uh, method of fighting, right? Um, in world history, you should have studied all of the terrible things about trench warfare, um, things like trench foot and uh, the rats and all of that stuff, right? It's just, it's dirty, it's nasty. Um, and, and because they dig in, right? World War I gets called a war of attrition. Uh, th this term attrition, right, means a very slow struggle, right? World War I is a slow struggle. It's this, it's, it's, characterized by these trenches, right? They're digging in, they dig in, and, and, and the fight really becomes, you know, you fight for weeks to gain a couple yards, right? A couple hundred yards, maybe to gain um, the next uh, trench, you know, but it, it, it's not this war of major land grabs. It's not this major war of troop movements, right? They're pretty stationary, they're dug in, and they are just uh, really seeing who can, out, who can survive the longest, right? It really isn't even a war about um, who can kill the enemy quicker. Um, it's who can survive the elements, who can survive things, again, like disease, trench foot, rats, the, the lack of food, who can survive those conditions longest. Results in the death of millions, we'll see numbers uh, a little later on, right? But at the start of the war, in the early years of the war, most Americans were not interested in joining the fight. When it came to major military conflict like this, we were still highly isolationist, right? Even though we had ventured out into the world, even though we had colonies now, even though we were a major player on the world stage, most Americans were hesitant about going to war. Most Americans were hesitant about sending troops in, okay? Um, however, naturalized citizens, right, who had still had ties to the nations they emigrated from, wanted the U.S. to enter the war, right? German Americans, people who had immigrated to this country from Germany become citizens, right? They took the citizenship uh, test and the citizenship oath. They became citizens of this country, right? They're naturalized citizens. Uh, they had strong ties to their homeland, right? So 
for example, again, German Americans, Hungarian Americans, Italian Americans, right? They're hearing these reports of their countrymen dying and fighting, and they want the United States to act, right? They want the United States to intervene. That's the group that really early on is pushing for the United States to get involved, okay? But the United States does not want to get militarily involved early on. They just want to support economically, right? Um, early on, early on, we are selling weapons and supplies to both sides, okay? The United States is funding and, and supplying both sides of this war, right? Germany and England, right? The central powers and the allies. But slowly but surely, British propaganda, right? And we're familiar with this term propaganda, right? It's, it's intentional, uh, intentional marketing, intentional advertising, intentional news stories, right? Intended to, to sway you a certain way, right? British propaganda begins to heavily influence the American public, okay? The British, we now know, they cut the transatlantic telegraph cable. And you're wondering, what in the world is that? It's literally the cable that stretched under the ocean, right, that allowed telegraphs, which was, you know, predates phone calls. You could send the, you know, the Morse code, like the beep, 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 beep. Yeah, that. You could send those, right, across the ocean because of this cable. They cut the cable. What that meant was that other European nations could not send their news or their messages to the United States as easily. So it ensured that most of what the Americans were hearing about the war came from British sources, okay? It came from British sources. So the United States, right, again, we, we think that this concept of, you know, fake news is, is new, right? Um, we think that it just started and, and like, oh my gosh, you know, it, it, it's, it's really just making life hard. Literally, the people outside of our country from we can look back, World War I, the British are intentionally making it so that the Americans are only hearing one side of the conflict, right? The German news outlets cannot get their news to America, right? So the British reports are the only thing Americans are hearing, okay? And, and the reality is that when push came to shove, America had much stronger economic ties with Great Britain and France two of the allied powers than we did with Germany, okay? And so when push came to shove and when public opinion was being persuaded by these propaganda stories coming out of Great Britain, you, the American public began to sway, have their opinion swayed to supporting the allies, right? Again, early on, we supported both sides, but now the Americans are gonna start pushing to just having the United States support the allies. Where these numbers come into play is that before we stop supporting Germany altogether, okay, at some point we will cut Germany off entirely, and we'll get to that in a minute. But even before we get to that point, we were sending more than double the supplies, the weapons uh, to the Allied powers, Britain and France, than we were with Germany, right? Uh, prior to this, even prior to the war, we were trading at double the rate with them than we were with Germany, right? So again, if you're an economist and the world is at war and you have to pick a side, if you pick the Germans, you're giving up this much money that you're currently trading with Great Britain and France versus if you just, if you pick the allies, you're just giving up this little portion that you're trading with Germany, right? So it makes more sense. Which one are you going to give up? Are you going to give up the one that's making you more money or less money, right? That becomes the, the logic. And so we, we, we tend to back the allies much stronger. The other side of that is not only are we trading with them more, but we need, the United States needs the allies to win because we've loaned them a ton of money, right? We talked about this with imperialism, right? Think back to dollar diplomacy. What was the logic behind Taft's dollar diplomacy? Remember, those Latin American countries were in great debt. They owed most of their debt to European banks. And the threat was that those European banks might show up to collect the debt, right? And so what was Taft's idea? Taft's idea was, well, if they're not in debt to Europeans, then the Europeans won't show up. So who do they get in debt to instead? They go in debt to us, 
right? They, we replace those European loans with American loans. That's dollar diplomacy. Well, what does that mean? We're all the more inclined to protect those Latin American nations now because we need them to do well. We need them to make money so they can repay us, right? Great Britain and France owe us a ton of money. We have loaned them so much money. And so again, you want to, you want to protect your investment. Think about it. Your parents and guardians, when they go out, if they buy a car or if they buy a home or they buy anything of value, right? You tend to treat things of value well. You tend to treat them carefully, right? If you see people with cars, right? They, they get them washed, they wax them, they protect them, they clean them, right? To protect that investment, right? You, when you invest a lot of money into something, you want to protect it. Think about your friendships. When you invest a lot of effort and, and energy and, and just time into relationships with people, right? You work hard to protect those relationships, right? You, you fight harder to protect the ones that mean the most to you, right? So it can be, a, you can think of this in terms of money or you can think of this in terms of friends if that makes more sense to you. But regardless, right? The ones that, owe, that you have a greater depth of relationship with in this case, uh, it's a financial relationship. They owe us a lot of money. We need to protect them and we need them to win because if they lose, there's no way we're ever going to get our money back, right? The other side of this, right? Again, it's all, it's all layered, right? You have so many layers to this conflict, but the U.S. really needs Great Britain to win because we need the British to continue to, to rule the sea. The British at the time have the number one navy in the world, right? That's the, the race between Britain and Germany, right? It's the race to have the best navy in the world. Prior to, this, uh, prior to the arms race between them, right? Great Britain had the number one navy in the world. Germany arguably had the second best navy in the world and we were sitting at number three. But if we want to continue to trade in Europe and in the in the you know uh, in the Atlantic and in the South Asian South China Sea and into the uh, you know the other side into the Pacific, right? If we want to be able to freely move about, we need allies over there protecting our ships because our navy can't always be there. And Great Britain is our closest ally. So if Great Britain has the best navy, then it follows that they'll be able to protect our ships better, right? If Germany takes over that spot and Germany destroys the English Navy, well, then we aren't really confident that our ships are gonna be able to, to move freely and trade, okay? So it becomes a, a, a benefit to us if the allies win, okay? Great Britain, we're gonna talk about it in a minute. They're gonna, eventually they're gonna blockade Germany, okay? Uh, when they do this, the US is gonna stop trading with Germany altogether. And we'll talk more about this in a minute because we're gonna look at why the English blockade Germany, okay? Um, really what it comes down to is Germany is threatening to destroy ships, okay? Germany is threatening that they're gonna use their new U-boats, uh, right, submarines, uh, to destroy ships. And so Great Britain decides that they're gonna blockade Germany. And when they blockade Germany, the Americans have to make a decision. Do we continue to support Germany and know that the English are gonna stop every American ship headed for Germany, right? They're, it doesn't matter that we're their friends. It doesn't matter that we're their allies. If they're stopping shipments to Germany, that includes us. Or we can stop selling to Germany and then Great Britain's not gonna stop our ships going anywhere else, right? That's what, that, that's the tension. So when Great Britain blockades Germany, the United States cuts off trade with Germany. And so Germany responds. And this is where things get dicey, okay? This is where this war begins to heat up even more. And the United States begins to slowly get dragged further and further into the conflict, right? When we're supporting both sides with supplies, we're not as heavily involved, right? We're not super uh, committed to either side, right? We're literally, uh, oftentimes this is used as a figure of speech, but we were literally selling weapons to both sides of the fight, right? Both sides were, were shooting at each other with American weapons, right? Uh, think Iron Man, like the first Iron Man movie, right? Like both sides are using, using Stark Industries weapons, right? For those of you that are nerds like me, you're welcome, right? But 
literally both Germans and the Americans, the allies, the central powers, initially they're using American supplies to fight each other. When we cut off Germany, Germany reacts, okay? Germany reacts and they respond to the blockade by issuing a statement that they will sink any British or allied ship, okay? So they will sink if, if in, in the Atlantic Ocean, right? If any British or allied ship, meaning France, the United States, right? We'll look at all the other countries that are on the allied list. If any of those ships enter German waters or what the Germans consider German waters, they're going to sink them. And they're going to sink them using their U-boats, their submarines. And the British and the United States and the rest of the world is like, well, that probably only applies to military ships, right? There's this code, right? We like, we like to, to live our lives by a, a code of morals, right? And we just assume that everybody else is on the same page oftentimes, right? And so the Allies just assume that when the Germans say that they're going to sink any ship, what they really mean is they're just going to sink the military ones or sink the ones with supplies for the military. But that is proven wrong. May 7th, 1915, the Lusitania, the Lusitania is an English cruise ship, right? Think princess and carnival cruises, right? It's, a, it's an, an English cruise ship. It is full of civilian passengers who, for whatever reason, in the middle of a war, thought it was a good idea to sail through the Atlantic Ocean where these powers are fighting each other. Who knows why? But the Lusitania is sunk. May 7th, 1915, the Germans sink this British passenger ship, okay? Kills 1,198 people, including 128 Americans, okay? Now, don't be deceived. The English were absolutely baiting the Germans. The English had absolutely put war supplies on the Lusitania. It was a cruise ship. It's a passenger ship, don't get me wrong, but they had loaded the hull with supplies, right? And again, it was under this, you know, kind of Trojan horse style disguise of like, oh no, we're just a cruise ship. We're just out having a nice sail, right? We're just out having fun. And the Germans are like, yeah, right. You're taking supplies to the front lines. So they sink the Lusitania, 128 Americans dead, right? And it gives British propaganda credibility, right? The British have been putting out this propaganda about these German monsters. They've been putting out this propaganda that the Germans are just terrible and they're killing people. And then Americans wake up one morning and find out that this cruise ship has been sunk. 128 Americans are dead. And immediately what flashes in their mind, right? They all remember, they're, it's not so far removed, right? Those who were old enough to remember, they immediately begin remembering the main, right? Remember the main to hell with Spain, right? Spanish-American War, the American uh, battleship Maine is sunk, right? Immediately they remember this. Now, major differences, right? One's a battleship that blew up, and we don't know why, the other one's a cruise ship that we know had weapons, that we know why it was sunk. We were, you know, we were fairly warned. The Germans technically warned us that they were going to destroy any ship, right? But the British play off of that uh, memory of the Maine. Americans certainly remember the Maine. They call, you see calls to remember the Lusitania, right? And this, this, this sinking of the Lusitania becomes this driving call. But, 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 but. The United States still isn't going to join the war, right? It's going to, when, when we finally get to the point where I'm like, hey, and now America has joined the war, you will see, mark this date, May 7th, 1915. That's the sinking of the Lusitania. We're not entering the war yet. The Germans after this are going to continue to sink passenger ships. They're going to sink two more passenger cruise ships, one French and another English. There are Americans on both, right? And the outrage be, continues to build in America of how long is the American government going to stand by as the Germans continue to kill American people, right? 
we, we tend to not like when our people are getting killed, right? That's generally good that, to not like when people die. But particularly in America, we get very angry when American lives are taken, right? And we rely heavily on our military to respond. And the American people are demanding at the time, they're demanding that Woodrow Wilson take us to war, except they're not. The vocal ones are. There's a large, uh, vo there's a, a, a vocal, shall we say vocal minority that is very loud in their opinion, that is demanding war. But there are still, at the time, there are people who are the silent majority in this case, right? They're not loud with their opinions. They're not saying much about the situation, but they are very concerned about going to war. They don't want to get involved, right? They're the ones that want to remain isolationist, okay? Well, Wilson, Wilson threatens to go to war. Wilson threatens the Germans that if they sink another passenger ship, that the Americans will join the war. And so the Germans back off. The Germans back off, okay? They back down. It keeps the United States out of the war. The very fact that the United States stays out of the war is what helps Wilson get reelected, right? He's only the second president to ever be reelected in the middle of a war. Now, granted, we're not in war, right? Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, we were at war. We'd been at war since 1861. He gets reelected in 1864. The war ends in 1865, right? Wilson, technically, we're not at war yet, right? If we want to get technical with it, we're not fighting yet. But this helps him get reelected in 1916, right? You see those buttons there. These are actual campaign buttons, right? Before bumper stickers and before social media, people used to make campaign buttons, right? And you'd wear them on your, your hat or wear them on your coat. Uh, this one says, War in Europe, uh, Peace in America, God bless Wilson. This one says, 1916, Wilson, he, he has kept us out of war, right? This, he has kept us out of war becomes the, the campaign slogan uh, for Woodrow Wilson's campaign. He's reelected, okay, in 1916. And then, as the expression is, things hit the fan, right? Uh, we won't say what those things are, but things hit the fan, okay? And it all starts in January of 1917. Remember, the elections in 1916, right, November, he gets, re he gets inaugurated in 1917. Um, and a telegram in 1917 is sent from the German foreign minister to the German ambassador in Mexico. Okay, so it's from the German foreign minister in Germany. He is sending a telegram to his German ambassador to Mexico. Okay, but the telegram gets intercepted by the British. Okay, and you can see uh, this is the actual telegram, right? This is this is an actual copy, the, the actual document itself, right? A scanned image of it. Um, this document is in the museum excuse me, in a museum somewhere. This here is part of the telegram that was eventually sent to the President of the United States uh, with the translation, right? So what you're looking at here is one page out of, I believe it's a four page telegram to, to the President of the United States. And this section here from we intend to where it says sign Zimmerman is the translation, the decoding of this one. Okay, um, when you go back, if you, if you go back and look at the slides on your own later, um, or if you just Google Zimmerman telegram and this image pops up, you'll notice these are all numbers. Okay, I know it's small. I have it small in there so we can see the translation bigger. These are not words. These are numbered. These are coded, right? This is a coded message, a secret message that the British intercept, they decode it and they send the translation to the United States. And it says this, when they, when they read it, right? This is what it says. It says, we intend to begin on the 1st of February, unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor in spite of this to keep the United States of America neutral, right? Remember, this is Germany, right? This is the German uh, foreign minister writing to his other German ambassador, right? He's writing to it, German to German, right? Saying that they, meaning Germany, intends to begin in February, unrestricted warfare, but they endeavor to keep the United States neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. 
make war together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you. You will inform the president of the above most secretly as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States of America is certain and add the suggestion that he should on his own initiative invite Japan to admit to it to immediate adherence and at the same time mediate between Japan and ourselves. Please call the president's attention to the fact that the ruthless employment of our submarine submarines now offers the prospect of compelling England in a few months to make peace. Signed Zimmerman. The translation for those of you that are like mind blown right now. Yeah, it says what it says, right? Germany is telling the, the German foreign minister is telling the ambassador from Germany to Mexico to go to the president of Mexico, right? He's saying, we're going to start unrestricted warfare. We're trying to keep the United States neutral. But if the United States joins this war, Mr. German ambassador, your job is to go to the president of Mexico and offer him an alliance where we will help him so long as he invades the United States, if he starts a war with the United States to reconquer Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, right? In other words, Germany is trying to keep the United States out of this war. If the United States decides to join World War I, he wants Mexico to attack so that the United States is forced to turn its attention there, right? And he's telling the, the ambassador, right, that it's his job to get Mexico to agree to this. Well, the, the telegram never makes it to the German ambassador, right? It's intercepted by the British, forwarded to the Americans, and it's on, right? How can you ignore this? Germany is secretly plotting to get Mexico to attack us, right? How do you, what, what are we going to do? Now, would Mexico have done it? Probably not. Remember, we just talked about this. Mexico is in the middle of, the, of a revolution. Mexico is fighting for their own democracy and their own independence. They're probably not in a position to start a war with the United States. But nevertheless, okay, this Zimmerman note does propose that if Germany wins the war, they would help Mexico get their land back, right, so long as Mexico started the attack. And oh, by the way, don't forget, Mexico is supposed to invite Japan to join him, right? He is supposed to invite Japan to join this fight against the United States. Because of this, the United States enters the war, right? Remember, the Lusitania was sunk in 1915. We don't join this war until 1917. So this, this idea that it's the Lusitania that gets us into World War I, that is a popular belief, and it's false, right? You can all be smarter than a lot of people, right? What is the thing that finally gets the United States to join the war with soldiers fighting? It's the Zimmerman note. It's this, this attempt by Germany to get the Mexican government to declare war on the United States, attack the United States, and invite Japan to join them, okay? The Zimmerman telegram. So it's on. The United States are going to start fighting, right? Now, most Americans didn't think we would actually send troops. There was this thought that just by entering the war, just by declaring that we were in the war, right, there was this thought that the central powers would surrender, that they would see the writing on the wall, that they would be terrified of big old America coming, um, and they would surrender. Well, that's not the case, okay? So where they thought we would only send military and economic aid, that idea goes out the door right away. We quickly have to build an army, okay? Again, we don't have a huge army. Think back to the Spanish-American War. We fought it with, with volunteers on horseback, right? Our army is not very large. We've put all of our attention into the Navy, and we've been isolationist, right? We're not built up. We're not prepared for this war. So we, we have to quickly build the army, right? Um, war, after, after war is declared, uh, uh, Wilson requests that Congress allow him to declare war April 2nd, 1917. Congress declares war April 6, 1917, right? Uh, and immediately, 
they, they pass a law of conscription, okay? Conscription, which is, is the draft, right? It's, it's, it's drafting people into military service, right? Essentially volunteering them uh, or, or being voluntold, right? That you are now being conscripted. You're being forced into military service. It's non-voluntary service. So the Selective Service Act, May 1917, okay? Again, we declare war April 6th. By May, we passed what is called the Selective Service Act, which meant that men ages 21 to 30 had to register for the draft, okay? Men 21 to 30 had to register for the draft. Over nine and a half million have been registered by June 5th, 1917, right? Within a month, over nine and a half million men, 21 to 30, are registered for the draft, okay? The draft is conducted by local draft boards, right? So uh, think about um, like our local elections, right? The county, at the county level, right? So every county pretty much had a, a draft board, okay? Four million, four million of those nine and a half million are going to be drafted into military service, okay? So nine and a half million register. And if you're not familiar with how it works, it's basically a lottery, right? You, you register, you're given a draft number, right? And if that range of numbers is called, you're in, right? So you could get a really, really uh, high draft number, right? Which would mean that it might take longer for you to get called and there's a chance you won't get called. But if you have a really low draft number, right? Chances are you're probably getting drafted into this war, right? Whether you want to fight or not, you don't have a choice. Uh, two and a half million of those four million are going to be sent overseas. The other one and a half million will stay uh, landside, right? They'll stay here in munitions factories. They'll stay here in shipping depots, right? But 4 million are drafted into service, okay? There are about 300,000 men in the country that avoid the draft that we know of. They're, they're called slackers or draft dodgers, right? Uh, this is not where the dodgers get their name, by the way. It's not a draft dodger, okay? Um, 300,000 avoid the draft. Uh, 4,000 were conscientious objectors. Okay, a conscientious objector is somebody who um, is uh, given the per given permission to not fight out of a uh, moral or a religious conviction, right? So people um, uh, people who you know their their religion is is peaceful and they don't believe in fighting. Um, people who uh, you know don't believe again really don't believe in war, right? They they are given a pass. 300,000 women, right? And this is what often goes overlooked. 300,000 women also join the military. Now, a couple things. Number one, they can't fight. They're not, that, let me rephrase that. They're not allowed to fight. I'm not saying women cannot fight. Uh, they are not allowed to fight in World War I. Women who join the military in World War I uh, are not in combat roles, okay? They're also not technically enlisted. They're not given a rank, okay? After World War I, women will complain and say, look at all we did for this country, and they will be given ranks uh, after the fact. They will be given, awarded their, their rank in the military after the fact, okay? But 300,000 of them serve, largely in secretarial roles, largely in administration, right? But nonetheless, they were in the military. They joined uh, largely the Navy, um, some of them in the Army. A lot of them became nurses, right? They were in the nurse corps of the Navy or the Army, right? Um, but Again, women also served. Now, the Selective Service Act is still in effect today, okay? Um, when you turn 18, okay? Uh, when you turn 18, men, gentlemen, this still only applies to you. When you turn 18, you have 30 days from your 18th birthday to register for the Selective Service, okay? Now, we have not used the draft since Vietnam. Right, and we'll get to that later. The draft has not been used again since then. Uh, when I turned 18, I had to register for selective service. Okay, um, I am now. I've I've completed my duty. Right, I I registered at 18, and once you're 25, you're done. You're out. Uh, you don't have to worry about the draft. Right. So, uh, when you're 18, you have 30 days to register. You have to register with selective service. They give you a selective service number. And you could be drafted. If we reinstitute the draft at any point, you could be drafted into military service until you're 25, okay? 
Um, so there you go. And if you're thinking like, well, I'm just not gonna do it. Um, that is how you get financial aid for college. When you apply for your FAFSA, when you apply for financial aid, you have to verify as a young man, you have to verify that you have registered for selective service and you have to give them your selective service number so they can verify that you are registered. If you don't register, you don't get financial aid, federal financial aid from college, okay? So gentlemen, put a alarm on your phone on your 18th birthday, right? Register. All right. So again, now that the United States is in the war, again, these are the major powers. On the allied side, you had what used to just be Russia, Britain, and France is now Russia, Britain, France, Serbia, Italy, Japan, and the United States. Okay, Japan joins the fight on the Allied side. Most people forget this, right? Most people forget that Japan and the United States were on the same side in this uh, because most people just think about World War II where Japan will not be on the same side as the United States. The central powers are still just Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, okay? Uh, Italy is off that list. As you can see, right? Again, Italy never fights for the central powers. And then you have a ton of countries who are neutral. You have a ton of countries that are impacted by this fighting, but they're neutral. Switzerland, Spain, the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Albania, okay? All right, by the end of the war, again, we're skipping major battles here. You learned all of that in world, world history. The whole point of this is just to give you a review, right? The legacy of this war, 22 million are dead at the end of the war. Half of those are civilians. This war is fought in the streets of Paris. This war is fought in the streets of London, right? This war is fought in the countrysides of France and Germany. Uh, of the 22 million dead, 11 million are military casualties. The other 11 million are civilian deaths. 20 million wounded, 10 million refugees, meaning 10 million people left without homes. And we're not talking about just home. When I say homes, I don't mean just literally their house was destroyed. We have 10 million people who are refugees, meaning they have no, they, they have fled their homeland. They have fled their country and they are seeking asylum and safety in another land. It costs $338 billion, right? This war's, war costs $338 billion. The US alone lost 48,000 soldiers in battle, 62,000 uh, were lost to disease, right? So 48,000 killed in combat, 62,000 die of disease, and another 200,000 are wounded. Now, keep in mind, we're only in this war for the last few months of the war, right? By the time we, 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 we joined the war in 1917, by the time we actually send troops, right? And by the time the war ends, we've only been there for the last few months of this war, and this is how much we lose, okay? 1919, 1919, the fighting is over and now the powers are meeting again in, in, in France at the, the Palace of Versailles in 1919 to discuss peace. Okay, June 28th, 1919, they signed the Treaty of Versailles. Okay, and you can see here, these are the, the world leaders here. You have President Wilson there, okay. The Treaty of Versailles does a few things. It establishes a few new nations. Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia become countries, right? They become independent countries of their own because of the Treaty of Versailles. It shifted some boundaries of other nations, right? It moved the borderline between France and Germany. This is key. This is gonna be a major point of contention when we get to World War II. This boundary line, the loss of what is called the Rhineland, along the Rhine River, right? This is gonna be a massive fight along with the Sudetenland, which we'll talk about later when we get to World War II, okay? It gave colonies to France and Britain. It gave colonies to France and Britain and it established massive punishment for Germany, okay? Again, this should all sound pretty familiar. I know I'm going quickly, but again, this is a, this should be mostly a review, okay? It greatly reduces the military that Germany is allowed to have. It sets, a, it sets a quota. They're only allowed to have 
they're not they're excuse me they're not allowed to have more than a certain number of soldiers at any one time they're also not allowed west of the rhine river right their military must stay east of the rhine river which if you're looking at a map the rhine river flows on the border of germany and france okay Germany is put on the hook for $33 billion in war reparations, right? They owe $33 billion to Great Britain, France, the United States, right? They owe money to the countries that they fought with. And the treaty includes what is called the war guilt clause, the war guilt clause, which forced Germany to accept sole responsibility for the war. Remember, the war started because Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist group. And when Austria-Hungary declared war, when they declared war on Serbia, right, the allies jumped in and that's where they begin to blame Germany. They say that Germany is the reason the war escalated. Germany coming to the, the, the aid, right, of Serbia, jumping in is what starts this war. Because Germany jumped in, Russia had to jump in behind Austria-Hungary. Because th those two went at it, <clears throat> the other nations had to join as well, right? So it includes this war guilt clause, which makes Germany accept full responsibility for the war. This is not going to go well. The Germans are not happy about it. And the Germans are not going to forget this. Now, the major influence at the peace conference, the major reason we even get to this deal, right? And this is where we will, we will wrap up for this lecture. The major player is President Wilson. Woodrow Wilson goes to Versailles and he emerges as this, this very influential leader, right? He comes up with what he calls his 14 points, right? And it's these 14 points that he believed would end all future wars, right? If these 14 things were done, we could avoid all future wars. Remember, we talked about this, right? His foreign policy is based on this idea of moral diplomacy, the spread of democracy to end wars, right? And he goes to Versailles to negotiate this peace treaty, and he brings his plan, this 14-point plan, okay? And this plan becomes the basis for the negotiations during the peace negotiations, right? As they're writing the treaty, they keep coming back to these 14 points, okay? Now, I'm, we don't need to know all 14 of them. I've grouped them together. What you need to know is that basically points one through five laid out how to prevent war, right? Points one through five laid out, <clears throat> excuse me, how to prevent war. Points six through 13 talked about ethnic nation building, right? Providing individual countries for different ethnic groups, right? Thus Poland, gets to become a country, right? Yugoslavia becomes a country, right? That, that We can see the direct correlation there, right? You have this population of Polish people, give them their own country, let them be Poland. You have this buildup of, of, of uh, Slavic people, give them their country, Yugoslavia, right? And point 14 is the cornerstone of this plan, right? Um, Point 14 is the like central idea, even though it's the last point, it's like the big one, right? It's his ace in the hole. It's, it's his like masterpiece, right? He, he views this last one as like his legacy. Um, and it's what he calls the League of Nations, right? The League of Nations. And, and the League of Nations, the idea was that in order to avoid war, we would make a council right, where each of these nations had a member. And this way, if anything ever happened, if there was ever a conflict again, rather than immediately going to those alliances and just blindly jumping in, right, the League of Nations could come together and say, wait a second, what happened? Oh, 
oh, it was just a, it was a rogue, you know, group that attacked. Okay, well, we don't need war over that. We just need to go after that group, right? The idea was that they could come to the table and talk to one another rather than just fight, okay? The League of Nations, okay? Today, we have the United Nations, right? So those of you who are looking for a comparison, the United Nations is essentially what he had in mind. It, it, it functions a little different, okay? But the United Nations is, comes about after World War II, okay? The United Nations comes about later. The League of Nations is like, you know, the, the beta version, if you will, okay? But here's the problem. Presidents don't get to sign treaties for the United States. They get to make them, but Congress has to approve them. So all of this, right? Wilson writes these 14 points. Wilson's plan is the thing that drives this whole process. They get this peace treaty through because of Wilson's 14 points. Wilson leaves Versailles a hero, right? The Europeans love him. He is a big deal. And he now has to come back to America and sell the plan to Congress. And we're going to talk about that next class. Okay, make sure you get your five sentence summary in your notes. And that is it for this one. We will pick up uh, looking at World War I on the home front in America in our next lecture.